Well, we're a quarter of the way through the Mariners' season, and for as high of the highs has been, 13-2 and two start, the lows have been as equal, where they went 2-12 and 12, leading into the most recent homestand. Curtis Rogers, Shannon Dreher, Danny O'Neill here, giving our quarterly progress report, I guess. I guess that's what we'll call it today. Um, Shannon, you're with this team every single day, and how have you watched this team this season – kind of knowing that playoff implications aren't exactly in the cards this year. I knew what to expect going in, and I think everybody who covers the team knew what to expect going in because you see what they are on paper, and there were obvious areas that were going to be strong. There were obvious areas that were going to be weak. We all wrote about it, so um, we didn't get as sucked in as some people. But... Um, there's a 13 and 2 start is fun. It's understandable that perhaps some could start changing expectations. But as a reporter who knows that you know there's going to be 162 games, who knows what the big plan is, uh, I've tried to keep my eye on the big picture through the good and the bad. And uh, the other thing that I would say is one of the learnings that I've had. I want to say you learn something in every season. And in the last probably five years ago and I don't have the numbers to back it up. It's just a feel, and hey, haven't I seen this before? Hot starts, A, you got. You don't want a bad start. A bad start can hurt you. Hot starts are great, can help you, doesn't guarantee to help you. But the really good teams, the teams that were in the playoff the year before, sometimes tend to start slow and then come on strong. So I didn't really think that they had jumped out that far ahead. I thought this is great. We're, I like what I see with them coming together. This is good for the entire process because they get going on a good note. It reinforces what they did in spring training, and there's nothing, you know, there's no negative to look at with a 13 and two. But I never thought that that would be representative, and I also didn't think that it was going to change the overall plan. So I have been watching it exactly the same as I talked about it in December, and January, and February, as the plan was revealed to us. I got reeled in. <laughs> like I did, like at 13-2, and two, and not thinking that they were going to win 100 games, but thinking that 90 wins was in play. Yeah, I did, I did start thinking that. And you knew that there were two flaws. The flaws in my mind when the season started were the defense and the bullpen, and we've seen both of those show up and be detriments to this team. I think that they started well enough that I began to hope that they were going to be in wild card contention through the course of the season. And I don't think that's outside the realm of possibility. It fell off sharper than I expected it to. Um, I think there's a lot of encouraging signs for the, 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 whatever you want to call it, the rebuild plan or the step back. I think there's a lot of really encouraging signs for that. I think Daniel Vogelback is playing himself into a position. I want to see him as this team's DH going forward. If they upgrade from him, great. But the idea if he was their DH next year, like, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that. Domingo Santana, I think he's got to show he can play a legitimate Major League outfield because the first the first 15 games, you're like, why did Milwaukee get rid of this guy for Ben Gamble? And now you see is that he can't be a fourth outfielder. As good a hitter as he is, if he's not one of your starting outfielders, he's not worth a spot on the roster because you need your fourth outfielder to be able to play defense. And he's that's, – that's the worst outfield defense I've seen from a regular outfielder. Like, Ricky Weeks – but he was, a, he was a career infielder, yeah. right? Like, you throw... It, it, it's, Manny Ramirez without the entertainment. Yeah. that there was, And, and with Manny, <laughs> like, you have to hit like Manny Ramirez did to be able to justify that kind of fielding. Right. And as good a hitter as Domingo is, he's not peak Manny. No. And the entertainment's a big factor, too. I will, Manny was one of my absolute all-time favorite players because of that. And you, I, I'm not sure Manny could do that today. You can't be a one-trick pony out there. You've got to do different things. It's funny that you look at Domingo that way and you look at Daniel Vogelback the way that you're looking at because Daniel's had a massive slump, and that was uh, him facing almost exclusively right-handers, which puts him, puts him in the best position. And I think that that's something that they need to learn about him. He went the better part of two weeks. I think it might have been a little bit longer where he was hitting well under 200. He was striking out like he hasn't struck out before. And that kind of gets, I'm not sure why. I think it's just the, again, that's part of the early season. Oh, this is what he did at the start, so let's, let's get excited about that. But that's something that needs to be figured out over the length of a season, not the first month, not a bad three weeks, not the first couple of months. But he's pulled himself out of it. Clobbering a couple of homers against the A's? Yeah, but, I mean, that's, again, two-game sample after just a really bad, as bad as, like, yeah. at the bottom of where they were for the last 
I guess I guess weeks. I've seen it in that we've seen players like Dustin Ackley where they've gotten hot or come up a house of fire. Nick Franklin a little bit even. Mm -hmm. Like he was really good when he first got up there and then they hit trouble and they can't get out of a slump. They can't mm -hmm. get, they can't correct. And, and you're right, it's only been a couple games, but I've been encouraged. Like I don't think that it's knocked him completely off kilter to the point where he won't be able to get back. I, I feel pretty confident about his ability to hit. I think he was off kilter and I think what we need to learn is how, if he truly is on. And what I love about Daniel is it seems like every home run he hits is a big home run. He's not hitting you know, the ones where, the, mm -hmm. not just loud, but in where they are in the games. It's not, it's big situations and I like that. But he's been challenged up quite a bit more and mm -hmm. we've seen him swinging at that. And over that span that I was talking about, I want to say his walks to uh, strikeout ratio was like 6 to 19. He walked for six times for 19 strikeouts. That's not him. And so now you want to see him. He's almost one-to-one -one on that when he's really going well. So you want to see if he can get back to that. And I, this is not, I'm not condemning or making an opinion one way or another on what he is. And I think you have to erase everything that you saw before this year because A, it's too short a look and B, everything was inconsistent. You're not going to find it on a handful of bats and a handful of bats there. But I mean, that's one of the huge things to figure out this season is how does he look across the length of a season? And, and how does he pull out of those things? So is he pulling out of it now? That'd be great. But what's going to happen in June? You know, is he gonna, mm -hmm. are we going to see the same thing? And that's what this year is all about. And we kind of learned a little bit about Domingo, how he pulled out of slump because he wasn't too far behind in that category as well. Again, you saw him swinging wildly when I think he put up some of the best plate appearances on the team in the first few weeks. And the next thing you know, he's swinging at every first pitch. He's uh, jumpy at the plate, and he's pulled out of that as well. So I think that those are the things that you need to be looking at right now. I think those are the things that are important for the future going forward because you do need to determine, we've talked about this before, is can Daniel Vogelback be your DH every day against left and right? And he hasn't faced very much left. And can Domingo field enough to be in the outfield? And if not, you've got two DHs, and that's not ideal. Does Domingo hit well enough to be a DH, everyday DH, do you think? I think we I need think to so. learn I that. Th I think I'm, I'm in on Domingo Santana as a DH. The problem is Daniel Vogelback. That's his skill set as mm -hmm. well. So how do you balance the two? I think it's a good problem to have that you've got two guys who could potentially hit well enough to be a designated hitter because... We've seen it in Seattle over the last 15-plus seasons. Not an easy position to go out and find here, which should be... You didn't like the Jose Vidro era? I did not. Or the Miguel Cairo era oh, either. Oh, forgot yeah. that one. He had wow. a couple of games at DH. That Jack was unbelievable. Cust. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been pretty bleak. So to have two controllable guys with a potential of being a designated hitter, I mean, that, that takes Find care of... Find out what they are. Exactly. That's what this season is all about. One thing we did learn, though... It's. Uh, I think a couple of years ago we might have been content to go, well, they both can, you know, maybe Daniel can play a little bit of first base and DH, Domingo can play a little left field and DH and make it work. I think we have learned the importance of average defense at best. You cannot be full fielding multiple positions. Especially with how the rest of the roster is constructed where you don't have average defenders. You've got below average guys at most of the positions. I think D. Gordon at second base and Mitch Hanniger specifically in right field are your two average to above average defenders. When you have a roster that has six, seven guys who are, are good at getting the balls, good at tracking fly balls, just fielding grounders, you can kind of hide two to three players just based off of their skill set. Whereas with this year's Mariners team, how it's constructed, Domingo Santana and Tim Beckham are going to stand out considerably than in years past. There's a difference between a below average fielder and an awful fielder. Catastrophic fielder. That, that, that's what we're discovering, <laughs> right? Is that it's not even that Domingo Santana, and he's the one guy that I have hope for, that he can become an acceptable fielder. So where even if he's below average, mm -hmm. he's not awful. You really can't have awful fielders in today's game. I think you need a plus center fielder if you're going to have that, too. Which is what they thought they were getting in Malik Smith, and now he's been brought back. But mm, even Maybe Malik's a little is... bit. I mean, I'm talking plus. I think Malik's probably maybe a little bit above mm -hmm. average, and maybe he can develop a little bit more. Um, but the good news on Domingo, as I was talking with outfielder coach Chris Prieto, is he's willing to work. He is out there, and it sounds like sometimes some of the changes have been slow 
to come for him and he needs more encouragement in getting to it, but he is out there working. And it's not just, you know, what he is doing in the field, but also in the base running as well, which, by the way, Mariners, I think, have the second best BSR in baseball right now. It goes yeah, why, how did that all of a sudden happen? I mean, did, did they go and take him out station to station, Lloyd McClendon style? <laughs> this is first base. Because I remember that happened, and then Robinson this Cano got second. picked off that Maybe night. Maybe it finally took in spring training, because it's not just stealing. Obviously, if D. Gordon and Malik Smith are stealing bases for you, that and their stolen bases are up, but they're not top five in that. This, a lot of this is the first to third and, and being smarter on the bases. So that's something that goes unseen. So kudos to them on that. That is something to build off and something to use, especially with Malik Smith coming back. We can see that put in play a little bit more, too. There's little addition by subtraction. Ben Gamble was a terrible base runner. Oh, my, and still yeah. is. Like, Ben Gamble looked good, because <laughs> everybody liked seeing his yeah. hair, so and the dust was going up, yeah. and it was like, oh, he's scrappy. He, he, he was a bad. He can Red Bulls yeah. in the dugout. That's, that, that's what he brought yeah. to the team. Uh -huh. uh, one thing in the first quarter of the season we've seen is injuries to some pretty well-known names with the Mariners. Kyle Seeger, who got injured at the end of spring training. Felix, who's currently on the injured list. Wade LeBlanc went down, Hunter Strickland. How are the Mariners going to balance bringing those guys back as well as trying to figure out what they've got? Because I think the third base spot, Ryan Healy, you may transition him to first base, but then what do you do with Edwin Encarnacion, Jay Bruce, Daniel Vogel back? And then in the starting rotation, what do you do when Felix and Wade LeBlanc are back healthy? There are a lot of question marks with how do you incorporate these guys back into your lineup? Well, I, I think often these things take care of themselves. Like it was going to be, is it going to be Wade LeBlanc or Eric Swanson? Oh, Felix is out. <laughs> you don't have to take care of that one. Um, I, I think that that is more apt to happen on the pitching side than on the offense side. And I just, you know, you deal with that when you have to deal with it. It also gives you the luxury to take your time with Felix, make sure that he is up and not just healthy, but looking good because he's going to need that boost of confidence when he comes back. I, I hope they use a handful of rehab assignments and don't just take them out for one and say, oh, he feels good, put him out there. I think that you're coming to that crunch where it's going to get uncomfortable, and I think you have to keep your eye on what the goals are and what is realistic, is that when Kyle Seeger comes back, uh, Ryan Healy, I, I think, is the odd guy out at that point because you've got that first base log jam. He's got options. You can send him down, and that just sounds, you know, just he's uh, made – Nice steps at third base. You're obviously not going to keep him there. His offense has been some of the more consistent offense that you've seen on this team over the last three weeks, so that hurts. He's improved his game in that he's not striking out nearly at the rate that he was. Still not walking, but he's not striking out. And so you've got another player that's doing this right now, and you know you hope he understands the process if that's it. But I think that's where you have to be honest with yourself and say at that point, so we're talking May 25th, Kyle Seeger comes back May 25th. At that point, they will have had two months to get into the season. Jay Bruce has had two months to get into his season. I think that that's one of the decisions that you're going to have to weigh. I, I think that Edwin Encarnacion, people know what he is. I think that he's upped his value and that he's shown that he can play first base every day, so he will be a Nas National League uh, option. But if Bruce, I'm not sure teams are looking at him and saying, well, yeah, you're hitting under 200, but these home runs are big. Are you going to be able to move him? And at that point, I think you almost have to weigh Bruce's contributions versus Healy's development. And Healy's development might not even be for this team. It might be to trade him. So I, I think that's where it's going to get very uncomfortable. I will say that I have uh, sickly enjoyed watching Edwin Encarnacion play first base. Me too. He's, he's the least flexible first baseman I've ever seen. <laughs> but but his, his glove's pretty good. Like his the ability to make scoops, like it doesn't... It does not look like what you would expect from a first baseman. It looks like he might strain something if he had to touch his toes. But it's actually been... I, <laughs> or dive I've, for a ball. Yeah, That's like I, I've, th I've thought it's been, it's, been, it's been better than I expected it to be. Um, I think Kyle Seeger you have a big question about, and that's a weird thing to say because he has been one of the only givens on this team over the past three or four years. And I think the question of he looked significantly different. He looked lighter. He looked leaner supposed to be more flexible changed up his batting stance is is that going to be is he going to be if he if last year was an indicator of the direction his career is headed he's not a long-term part of this team for the future and for him i think it's showing can he have a little bit of an uptick or or, or have we seen the best of him because if we've seen the best of him then i think that there's financial implications of that but there's Quite, you've got to find someone else to play third base, and, and maybe at that point Ryan Healy does become a, a, a better long-term 
option for them as opposed to Seeger because you still got what four years of Seeger left essentially got three if he's traded the fourth year has to be picked up by which makes it difficult because it'd be his, very hard to trade him yeah he's not makes, going anywhere it makes it tougher although it, we said that about Robinson Cano too so it's just how much of the money you would have to right. eat to be able to do that and I think that really the question is going to be is can, can Kyle Seeger be uh, he's a good defensive player at times has been a great defensive player, has also struggled at times with routine plays. Can, can he be a guy? Do you want him starting at third base for you to begin next season? And as we've seen in the past with Kyle Seager, he's a notoriously slow starter. He's a guy who takes a month to get going. Right. Whereas if he took a month from May 25th when he's eligible to come off the injured list, we're talking about close to the all-star break. Well, it's well, that April is what it is. It's April that's the problem. Oh, right? so okay, so it'll be yeah. fine. The marine <laughs> layer is <laughs> It'll be fine. It. Oh, yeah, also that marine layer stuff. Anybody talking about the marine layer, Mitch Hanniger put back-to-back -back home runs out in the upper Up, deck yeah, of left field. Yeah. Like that, that is, well, the ball the is juice. that's Danny. <laughs> yeah, no, there's no doubt about that. But like watching that, nothing. like that was wild. <laughs> like that was, that is not common for balls to go up there, and he did it in back-to-back -back games. Hopefully that's a good sign for him because yeah. they need that bat to start coming around too. That's an easy, interesting Kyle Seeger conversation right there. And you're going to have to give him a minimum of a month to get into it. Mm -hmm. Not just, you know, forget slow starter. Any player needs a good month, probably two, to really kind of show where they're at right now at, at the start of a season. And this is the start of his season. So that'll be, you know, they're going to have to watch that closely. Here's an interesting, somebody uh, tweeted me this when it looked like D. Gordon was going to be out for a while. He said, why not put Skinny Seeger back at second base? That's where oh. he came up uh, in yeah. the minors. He was a, 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 a yeah. He started a couple of years at second for, what, a year and a half? Yeah, two years. because that's, that's what he profiled there. as. And that was a big part of the, the change when he started trying to pull the ball more because he figured bigger, as a third, third baseman base. you need to hit for more power and that was a trade-off that if that was the spot he was going to play he was going to need to provide more power that's an interesting idea I, I think that if you're the Mariners you're trying to answer the question this year or at least say is this still a possibility that if we're expecting to be good in, in 2021 like if we're expecting the the second half of 2020 and 2021 to be legitimate contenders can Kyle Seeger be a starter on a team that we expect to contend and I think that based on what we saw last year, the answer would be no. Can he have a little bit of an uptick? Can he change that trajectory where you could still see him as being part of a team when it's ready to win? That's going to be fascinating to watch because if you, you, know, if you forget, he did make the major physical changes that you talked about. And a, part, a lot of what they were saying at the end of last year is he was just so big in the wrong places that he could not get to certain pitches. He could not get into the right positions that were going to give him the success and he, he looks completely different he's kept that up through the injury uh, he didn't put too much into that it sounded like but ball players will tell you one thing and be yeah. doing something else as well so I'm really eager to see is this it was this the big change that he needed to make and he does look different at the plate he's got a different stance as well so we'll see so last thing before we wrap it up here we're a quarter way through the season the next quarter will take us to the all-star break what do you want to see from this team heading into the All-Star break? Hmm. I guess I should stay consistent with it, and I guess I should say I want to see the young players who profile to be a part of this team continue to progress. Um, I, I, and that, that goes for players who aren't on this team right now and are at the minor league level. I'd like to see Justice Sheffield get that command on a regular basis down in Tacoma. That's that, important. That's what I would say. I want to see Justice Sheffield in the starting rotation, and that's not about the Mariners. That's about Justice Sheffield. He walked five batters his first appearance in Tacoma, and that has really set the tone. He throws too many pitches. He nibbles. He's not, he, he needs to be, and he needs to, to start showing some of the trajectory as a starting pitching prospect. I think Eric Swanson, he's been, seen some ups and downs, but I think there's some promise there. But Justice Sheffield, for that trade to be worthwhile, Justice Sheffield needs to be a big league starter for the Mariners. So I want to see that. Honestly, I, I hope that either Jay Bruce or Edwin Encarnacion is no longer on this roster. Mm -hmm. And if that means that someone trades for Encarnacion because he has value, or it means that the Mariners have decided, it's hard for me to imagine somebody looking at Bruce's numbers right now and thinking, yeah, I want some of that because his average is so low, but he does, he's shown great power and he's hit him in big spots. But I, I would say that when they come back from the All-Star break, I'd like to see one of those two guys elsewhere. 
And we like Jay Bruce. He's been huge for this team behind. The, he does so many of the things that help with the players, and, and that's that's been huge. But I think the intent has always been to move those two on. And if somebody is knocking, and this is new for us. We haven't had log jams where players are blocking players in the Mariners' system for a long time. Mm -hmm. and, and it's an adjustment. But I, I'm sure you know upstairs and Jerry DePoto is well aware of that. And if somebody is knocking on the door. They want them up at this level to get as much experience when they are ready. They're not going to hold back on that, I don't think. And Bruce's presence, honestly, the fact that Bruce and Encarnacion are here, it means that you're going to see more Mitch Hanniger in center, which I, you I think... You don't want to see yeah, that. You yeah, want, you want Mitch in right field. Yeah. So that will wrap up our quarterly report. We'll probably check back in around the All-Star break. So for Shannon Dreyer, Danny O'Neill, I'm Curtis Rogers. Keep it locked here on 710 ESPN Seattle.